Well, could you tell us a wee bit about your experiences at the Josie, Warren? Well, yes, Jack. I, uh, in fact, I remarked on my that I, my mining career started in the Leroy. Uh, really, it actually started in the Josie. Father was employed there at that time in the blacksmith shop with my uncle Tom Crow, and uh, I guess it was through Dad that I went out there to work for a Mr. Talbert that was in charge of uh, ore sorting. We weren't actually underground, we were on the top, and during, it was just about that time that Mr. Billy Turner, who later became mayor of the city, he was just out from the old country and stayed with an English family by the name of Lindsay. There was another English chap whose name I can't recall, but I was employed with them in, at that time, the ore sorting consisted of the, the uh, ore was brought up from underground, dumped down over the grizzlies, the fines separated, and we stood on these tables sorting the, uh, the ores from the waste. I possibly worked there on the course, maybe not. It might have, I don't think it exceeded 60 days, but uh, that was my work constituted. That's what my work constituted at the, at the Josie. The Josie was quite a prosperous operation. At that time, it was being run by an English syndicate that also had the uh, the nickel plate and the Columbia Kootenai mines. Uh, and this sorting was all by hand, was it? By hand, Jack. It would come down over the Grizzlies, which consisted of rails laid so the fines would go through. And then we took iron hooks and raked the, uh, raked the ore that would be hung up in the Grizzly down to this table. And then we were all sorting by hand, picking out the waste, whichever predominated, Jack. If there was more ore than waste, well, of course, we picked out the waste. Excuse me. Warren, could you tell us something about riding the cages in the mine? I imagine it was quite an experience. Yes, it was, Jack. Uh, the first experience, I'm, uh, I used to uh, see various people on the first trip underground. They would uh, <laughs> be somewhat amazed with going under these cage and standing there and all at once the bottom dropped from underneath you. You imagine you were falling. I think your stomach was up near where your throat is supposed to be. But, uh, and flashing by these stations, this cage was traveling. It wasn't vertical. It had a very steep cut to it. But going by these stations where lights were always on stations, they just looked like little stars. You went down that fast. It didn't take a moment to drop down nor come up these shafts. But it was, I think, all experienced a quite a, uh, a quite a sensation to be standing on this bottom part of the skip and then all at once it would just seem to drop so suddenly that you never had time even to gather your thoughts about you. But I'm sure everybody that experienced had a, quite an experience going through the first time they rode in skips. Uh, I think I covered that the other day, the side of the skip here. We used a two-decker, but over in Butte where there was five and six-decker skips, it was quite a sight to see. It was gauged, of course, it had the, uh, up at the hoist room, the indicators were so marked on the reel that you know exactly, the, in fact, the operator knew exactly where the skip was. And he used to lower and drift it, let it go down there. <laughs> I don't think he used a brake at all. It just let it ramble down. Of course, he'd have to check its flow at the bottom. But Could you tell us a bit about the horse racing in, in Rosslyn Warren? Well, of course, the big event stood there, Jack. It was in the, uh, mostly occurring during our winter carnival. And uh, some uh, during the summer, too, we had races, but the Winter Carnival's races stood out. At one time, they had a race there, and they brought in a dark horse, which was a dark horse, a stranger. Nobody knew much about him. Of course, old Mr. Shenworth had a horse named Ginger, which was the local horse, and he was uh, a good horse for Columbia Avenue, but as far as a track horse goes, but he had everything beat around there. Well, this Indian brought in this horse, and uh, he contacted me if I would ride this horse for him at this race. Well, I said, sure. I went over and looked the animal over, and quite a rangy-looking horse, and I didn't think he'd have any trouble handling him. But I told the Indian I would ride him, not with a saddle, with a jockey saddle. I would ride him just with a surcingle. That was a strap that went around the feather, or the forepart of the body, and you get your knees in there where you could go up on his haunches. Well, the day of the race, of course, some of them got to know about this horse being in. There was a lot of comment made about this horse was, well, i am he did. He was off the Allen track in Spokane. He was really a racehorse. And probably the horse knew a lot more about running than what I did. But nevertheless, them days, this particular race, there was four horses scratched in the first heat. Well, leading up to the first heat, this horse that I, I was riding, at that, that time, we used to go back a block and then come up abreast to the tape. And when we hit the tape, which was right where uh, Spokane Street is there, 
when we hit that, we run to the end of Columbia Avenue where Taylor Road turns down, and uh, we try and come up abreast. Well, twice it happened that this horse was ahead, and I couldn't hold him up. And of course, they that was a false start. Well, he'd run me up the up to the, the hospital before I held him back. And after the third time he got away, Joe Honey, who was the official starter, he said, another break like that and we're disqualifying you. Well, I said, well, you want to get the horse out of the race anyway. I said, you people know this horse is going to win this race. And a little argument ensued, of course, but nevertheless, I said, well, if that's the case, I know I can't hold this horse. I'll take a standing start. I said, a broadside start. That meant uh, facing, instead of looking up the street, Jack, I was looking across the street to give the horse. I was right on the tape. Well, the other horses went back, and of course, when they got up as far as this tape, they were already in stride. I was taking a cold start. Nevertheless, the first heat, I took that, what I call the cold start, and, uh, well, there wasn't any trouble. This horse just walked away from everything there. Well, they didn't know what to do. The officials then, they thought they'd have to do, and they did do something drastic, which was absolutely contrary to horse racing. They rung in two more horses for the second heat, and uh, two riders who... Well, Bert Grant was one, and Nero Wilson was the other. They were like myself, raised on these cayuses, but I had to take another cold start. Well, the second heat, by the time I got turned my horse, did, these horses had the way blocked. That's what they were in there for, to use as a block. Well, I give the horse his head. He went around, but in order going around, about in front of the Bank of Montreal, he had to cut off the beaten track and go out into the snows where they had dragged it, and, of course, he got out there, and the moment he hit that soft snow, his knee, his front legs went down, and they kind of buckled, and I went clean off his head. I'm 30 feet ahead of him. It's a good job I wasn't riding with a saddle, for I'd had trouble with the stirrups. And the horse ran away. Of course, there was disqualification. Anyway, sh old Mr. Chenoff got the purse, whatever it was, maybe $100, $200 anyway. It didn't matter to him, because they just walked into the Allen Hotel, and the $200 was put in the bar, and everybody drank to the... <laughs> to the health of, <laughs> of Dutch Schnauth. But uh, that was one experience that stands out in my mind, horse racing. The other, of course, was... Did you ever get that horse back? No. Oh, yes, yes. The Indian finally caught his horse. He was owned by an Indian. The Indian brought him in here. He was kept in... Uh, the horse was finally caught, and the Indian took him back home, very disappointed, which he had a right to be. <laughs> but in the... Uh, another feature we had during the Winter Carnival was horses. They put the collar and the hames on, and leave the traces on with the rope on, and you hung on there and got behind him with skis. Well, the snowball that would fly back there, I tell you, <laughs> you had to keep uh, a good many black eye I got from being socked with the snowball from the horse's hoof, I said. But uh, it was a, quite an experience, horse racing in rod, and at one time, I don't know why I recall that, uh, maybe I did on the last interview, that where they brought this horse over from Nelson the baggage car, and we raced at 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> So we was up to all kinds of capers those days, but it was a lot of fun. And I, but the horse racing was a, quite an event, and was, everybody looked forward to it. Um, I understand they had a few lady riders around too, didn't they? Ladies? Oh, yes. Yes, we often, there was, uh, well, the Newman girls, were, they were known as the Newman girls, them days, they resided at Patterson. Uh, one is called, well, Mrs. Rowley Crow were one, and I think the others, Mrs. Atwell, them girls, they can recite some uh, instance because they had a horse named Rags. He was a yellow horse and a very good horse. And their father was a, quite a horseman, old Clay Young. And they had this horse that they would come up and enter. And I think the girls rode them once or twice, if I remember correctly. And then another girl also rode, she was from down at Northport, Mabel Hannah. Now, to give you an, uh, the last race that was ever run, I owned a little black mare. She was small, but she was fast. And uh, Nick LaFace at that time had a horse. Well, this celebration was on in the summertime in Ross, and I forget the occasion. But there was a race between this horse that I had and Nick LaFace's horse. Well, I got this girl to ride my little horse because uh, she wasn't a very heavy horse, and I had to have somebody that was real light to ride her. And uh, this uh, Mabel Clark, it was later Mrs. Hannah, uh, she consented to ride this little black horse of mine. She was a good horseman woman. And uh, Chenault rode uh, Nick LaFace's horses. Well, there was just the two horses, and of course, Columbia Avenue was lined with, with people, ladies and baby buggies and whatnot. It was, and uh, right in the Bank of Montreal, this horse that I had, this little black mare, was 
she must have got hit with a car one time, for she was very nervous, and she really shied from cars. If she seen an automobile, boy, you, she was hard to control. Nevertheless, the cars were all cleared off of Cumbie Avenue, but somebody had come up from behind the Allen and left a car right there on the, on the intersection, well, on the side of the intersection. Well, the horses got away. I think I won the first heat and the second heat. As I'm, they, these horses are coming up, this uh, horse of mine seen that car, and she shied and went clean across the street and ran right into the steps of the Bank of Montreal. Skinned her uh, around the knees and the locks, knocked a couple of people over, and that was too much. The civic authorities then said, that was the last race that was ever run in Roslyn, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could you tell us something about the livery stables in those days? Uh, well, the livery stables was a, quite a place of record those days. In fact, we didn't have anywhere else to, to hang around. You'd come downtown and... The livery papers seemed to be a uh, seemed to be a place where young people would gather. More of the the younger the men of those days, well, us kids and everybody. It's uh, after well, I graduated from the livery stable. I was one of the graduates. There were several of us graduated from the livery stable. There were certain qualifications them days in order to qualify such as cleaning out barns and whatnot and currying horses and everything, Jack, that went with it. But we, uh, that used to be kind of a center location. And uh, we had a lot of connection with horses them days. There were a lot of pack trains that used to be. I packed out of Roslyn. Oh, I think the, I would say about eight is the largest head that I ever packed out. And I packed out uh, towards Sheep Lake. There were some men then that had some properties and they come up to do their assessment work. And I'd pack the horses out. And then when the pipeline was being laid from Murphy to from Rock to Murphy Creek, all of that pipe was packed. I packed all that pipe with two horses. Yeah. I'd put one horse ahead of the other and then put a ten foot section of pipe, three of them or four of them, one on each end of the horse. And I was in charge of that operation. I packed in there for Dave McLeod. And it was a, it was quite a feat when you look back and considered. You had to keep them horses in step and you had to annoy your horse and keep it pretty well lined. Oh, I run into some difficulties, but nothing of any serious consequence. But I packed the pipe out. I was riding along one day, coming back. I had taken the pipe off and was herding the other two horses back. And I never moved in the saddle much. I just, uh, I had fed the horses out there, and I didn't tighten my cinch good enough anyway on mine. Apparently, I didn't. Anyway, I climbed in, and I was riding along the trail, and I got out to where the road was. And one of these horses wouldn't go by something that was there, and I reached over to slap him. About that time, saddling me and everything went off the horse. Well, this horse took off down the road, and there was enough rope on the saddle that I had tied around his neck just to give the saddle enough play that every time he jumped, the saddle would jump and hit the ground. I tore off the horn and the back and everything. <laughs> so little instances of that kind come back, I can recall. But the livery stable was always quite a place for the, for a gathering of the... Well, it'd be the transportation center of the town. Then, well, it was. At them days, Jack, we didn't have cars. And um, they, uh, both stables, uh, both, well, Plester took over afterwards and Mike Donovan. But when McLeod and Henderson run them stables, they, uh, they took a lot of pride in their, uh, in their carriages and the harness and the horses. You had to clean the horses and brush them off and also keep your harness with harness oil, spick and span. And your buggies were always the topmost shine. And, oh, the transportation with with the uh, with the uh, horse uh, was uh, quite a well. It was the modern way of conveyance. Them days we didn't have anything else that we knew of that would ever take the place of a horse. And a lot of the roads, the old trail road, a lot of the roads were built for such uses, not for automobiles. That's but uh, uh, we used to have a good team there, and all the officials from the smelter and everybody. I used to glorifying getting behind that team they could step and bring up their feet oh i tell you it was something to see jack in the winter they had these big uh, two-seater sleds. oh yes jack in the winter time we take a big democrat possibly oh 10 12 feet in length and possibly a four foot width and it have the front just as uh, the uh, the seat in the front would be elevated and the back behind we'd scatter a lot of hay and then put buffalo robes on and the young people would get together and we'd make trips to trail. Somebody would have a mouth organ and maybe some other musical instrument. And then there were a lot of delight those days. And, and especially, I used to drive for myself, four horses, and you had to keep them under control. And they, 
go along always at the trot going down. There was never that way coming back for the grade was too stiff. But going down to hear those sleigh bells, Jack, and that music, it, it stands out in my mind now. As a, it, it was really wonderful. And everybody singing, you know. And But I used to carry a pack sack, and I carried the tune in the pack sack. I've never known much as a singer, Jack. Uh, did you ever have any experiences with a cutter? Oh, yes. Yes, cutters used to be... I had my own... Uh, when I had that little black mare, and Med McKaylee had a horse, we used to get the two of them together and get in a cutter with buffalo robes and possibly two or three heated bricks for our feet, and we'd make lots of trips around. With the sleigh and them horses would... Well, this cutter wasn't much weight, Jack, in the way they'd step out. I remember you folks had a gray horse up there where, and uh, he was a quite a horse. First time we were out to Sheep Lake. There was a party that worked for your father at that time by the name of uh, Mr. Healy. He was later, he was followed later by Mr. Benson. And at that time, that gray horse was used for going around lowering down the arc lamps and putting new, ar new carbons in, Jack, and then hoisting it up. And uh, we packed that horse. This horse was used for that purpose. We packed out to Sheep Lake when I was about, oh, about 10 years old at that time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that started us kids towards Sheep Lake, and then ever after that, we'd come home on a Friday afternoon and grab a, uh, grab a blanket and a loaf of bread and steal mother's butcher knife and run all the way to Sheep Lake. <laughs>